Welcome to the Manufacturing Masters Podcast with your host, Allison DeFord. Hey, thanks for tuning in. Today's guest is going to rock your world. I have had the pleasure of working one-on-one with Brad Robeson of Clean Machine. He's a manufacturing owner. He is prolific, smart as hell, funny, and has one of the best beards I've ever seen. He and I are going to get into a fantastic conversation about workforce development. And let me tell you what, this is different than anything you've heard before. So you'll want to tune in. He talks about how workforce development should really be a verb and not a noun. This is fantastic. I've never heard anybody talk about this before in this way. So you're going to want to listen to what he has to say. He shed some light on some Gallup research that's absolutely um, shocking about students um, as young as the fifth grade and why we need to change our education system as well as really show up as manufacturers, working with our state, our MEP, our local schools, vocational schools, school counselors, in a nutshell, why we need to take action to influence the next generation of manufacturers. So thanks for spending some time with us today. This is going to be a good one. Everybody, here we grow. Well, today, everybody, you have a treat. The man, the myth, the bearded legend. Brad, thank you so much for being on the Manufacturing Masters podcast. Allison, it is my honor, and I'm really excited to share uh, about workforce development today. Yes. And you know what I'm excited about? Because there's, we hear about it every day, right? There's, we've been talking about it. There are a lot of people doing something about it. And then there are manufacturers like you who are doing a lot. And that's what I'm so excited about is for you to maybe enlighten people. You're in Utah and you're part of the Utah Manufacturing Association and I believe Impact Utah and local working with local schools like you're in deep and you're seeing results and it's there's just a lot of exciting things to share and and my reason for having you today is I think besides being um, a successful manufacturer and a really smart guy and a really good human I think it's impressive, and I think a lot of other manufacturers can learn a lot from what you are doing personally with your business to remedy this crisis and also what you're doing with with Utah. So you talk about workforce development as being a verb, not a noun, and I would love it if you would expound on that. Well, I feel, you know, in any leadership position and when you want to, you know, cause results, you have to be in action. And I felt like after the pandemic uh, started tailing off, getting employees was like waiting for a piece of space junk to fall out of the sky and (laughs) land in your backyard. Just wasn't going to happen. In addition to that, I spent enough time with, you know, the organizations you mentioned and and others, and it was interesting to me that they all focused or said they focused on workforce development and that they had the resources to, you know, do something about it. And so I asked the question, well, then why do we have a workforce shortage and why do we have a skills gap? In other words, what do you do? Well, I didn't mean to put anybody on the spot, but of course you get deer in the headlights looks. And um, I I had a concept in my mind about painting down a four-year commitment for any student, whether it be college or in this case, a vocational training program. And we were able to arrive at a two-year program that I felt was appropriate for the high school level. And so uh, we engaged you know, with that concept. And that process started out um, with a roundtable discussion about 
who we are as an industry, machining companies, uh, machine shops. And um, the initial response from Department of Workforce Services was, well, this falls into one of the six hazardous occupations and we can't have students participate. Mm -hmm. So I asked the question, what, what is the description, which they sent me, and I read it. And it basically described uh, metal fabrication operations circa 1940. <laughs> so my, my point here is that ask questions, qualify. Yes. Everybody I worked with on this effort in this team is very valuable. But what I found like with the schools, they don't know what they don't know. And if industry isn't providing them the right inputs or the proper requests, then you're not going to get a product that you need. And so we focused on working with schools to arrive at a relevant curriculum for kids interested in manufacturing, things they could teach in class. And then we agreed upon those things that could be uh, on the job learning uh, situations. And uh, we just finished our pilot program uh, here last couple of months, and we just announced the launching of this program statewide. Yeah. Yes. Did that feel so triumphant? Not yet. But not yes. yet. Not, no, I'm not done. <laughs> I'm not done. I'll tell you why. Before I get there, though, I really got to give Dr. Tony Schmitz, who's a professor of mechanical aerospace and biomedical engineering at the University of Tennessee. He's also a researcher who works on ways to solve key part of our American manufacturing challenges, and that is preparing workers to leverage today's technology and advance tomorrow's technology. And he wrote a paper he published back in January of this year, which really addresses and aligned with what my thinking was, and that is we really need to educate uh, we really need to make sure our education system is set up in a way to advance students of any interest um, and then provide the means for them to learn for something they're interested in and then provide these opportunities for them to have a hands-on experience. Mm -hmm. We also joined up with our local vocational schools. Their attendances have been way down. I felt like if we could just get a, a, a kid to commit to a two-year program while in high school, give them the beginner intermediate training uh, as a machinist, a CNC machinist, then we could then farm them out to the vocational schools so they'd kind of have a built-in supply of students. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're not at that point yet, but the uh, most of the vocational schools are, are on board with that. So uh, where I'm headed with this whole thing is, is I'm not thinking about it in terms of just CMC machine. I'm thinking about manufacturing as a whole. The burning platform for me was, or is, is that you know, we started defunding uh, vocational training about 20 years ago or more, and we're now feeling the effects of that. We don't have a skilled workforce. We don't have people in a, to a large degree training in today's technology. Um, in addition to that, the offshoring effort that took place in the 90s, we're paying for that today. We have a reduced amount of products being produced in the U.S. But hopefully we can bring that back. But, you know, by those choices we made as business leaders, we're now finding ourselves uh, in a result of that. And now we have to do something about it. And that's why I look at this as an action, not just a talk. Right. To make it more compelling and why I believe education can and should be, you know, we're the biggest partner in this uh, as an industry leader or as a business owner is that uh, kids, uh, Gallup has showed that kids begin to disengage in the fifth grade. And by the time they hit high school, 66% are disengaged. So what do we do with that? I, I kind of look at that as there's our opportunity right there on a couple of fronts. So when I started thinking about where is this workforce, I dug into the numbers of Utah. So for example, 
there's a class uh, probably measured back in junior high of about 50,000 students. Well, 10% of those drop out in high school. So you have 45,000 kids graduating, 60% of those kids go to college. And of that 60% that went to college, 10% of those drop out after the first year. So, you know, I netted out the numbers of available students to reach, and there's about 25,700 kids annually that we could somehow educate on today's manufacturing careers put together a, a curriculum that they can hopefully get into as early as junior high mm -hmm. and then leave high school with the ability to either stay in the trade they're, they're learning or they use it to move on to other things such as engineering or programming or whatever. So that's, that's the case for me. And also you know, on a national level, you, know, you think about what can be made, what can't be made with today's skilled workforce. An example that Dr. Schmitz brought up was we set out to produce 12 new submarines. Well, there's 50,000 skilled workers required to produce those 12 submarines, and there's a lack of workers to get that job done. To me, that's a national security issue. Right. So large scale, it's that. So anyway, that's my burning platform, uh, which I'm operating from. Um, point here is if you want to affect change, be a part of it, get involved, work with schools to help you find what our needs are as industry, you know, work with uh, the government and other associations that are in a position to provide the right resources to get this type of thing done in place and facilitated. Yes. Well, <clears throat> I was, it was interesting. I had Nicole Walter from HM Manufacturing on here recently, and she brought up some really good points. And I wanted to see if you've experienced this or what advice you would have for manufacturers who say, I'm a small manufacturer. I don't have the time to bring in interns. I don't have the resources what would you say to them? Well, I I have 32 employees. I'm a very small shop. You make the time. You actually, through this process, we discovered, we knew we had to do something and we knew we had to make the time to make sure we had somebody who was acting as our training coordinator, who was also producing and running machines. We spread out that um, that burden, if you want to call it that, amongst everybody in the shop because I pitched it as an opportunity to grow personally. Mm -hmm. um, and it's worked very well. And all the employees I've talked to, which I talk to every day, they're excited about it. They want to know when the next class is coming. Aww. They they actually feel good about you know sharing their knowledge with a young person. And fortunately for us, the attitude of the uh, young people coming in here has just been phenomenal. You don't have to push them to do anything. They, they get on board, very intelligent, and start contributing to our production models, which is really nice to see. Yes. Oh, I love that. Well, two questions on that. So did you initially get, did the employees initially push back and say, you know, my plate's full or did you find the majority were like, all right, all right, we'll, we'll follow your lead. We'll give this a go. You know, we, we didn't receive any pushback at all. Um, again, it was maybe how it was teed up with them that, you know, this is something that we all realized that we hung banners. We put ads out on every social media site, newspapers. I almost went out, you know, in my, in my, dancing bear suit and balloons and stood out by the street and no response other than what I'd call the professionally unemployed, you know, had come in to check the boxes. So, uh, we knew we needed to do something. Uh, fortunately I'm a part of a machining association here in Utah where, you know, we've agreed we don't poach 
and we don't advertise to other shops about openings we may have. And I respect that. Yeah. And so we all agreed we need to take this on ourselves. And, you know, I collaborated with two other competitors of mine to, to work on this project and get it done. That's fantastic. Well, and, and I've had the good fortune to work with you. Um, and also the Utah Manufacturers Association. And I know one of the huge caveats to this is <clears throat> reaching at risk or low income students who have had to start working in high school to help pay the bills. And so they're stretched a little thin. They also aren't encouraged to go to a post-secondary school or, you know, that their, their paths are often feel, they feel limited and they're not encouraged at home necessarily. Do you, and I, I don't know that you would have the number off the top of your head and I don't remember either, but I was, it just felt so hopeful that if if every state and every manufacturer like yourself because like I said it's got to come I feel like the work you're doing is so incredible and important it just seems like there's so many thousands upon thousands of kids who could have a better life if they found out this exists this is an opportunity for you um, you'll make great money You'll work in a clean facility. You'll be a, an appreciated part of a team and you'll be making things, you know, for rocket ships and automobiles. And I mean, fill in the blank. Like it, it's, do you feel like that's a huge, um, I don't know what the right word is, a huge component of this? Because there's a lot of kids that are just, you know, they, they're going to go, yeah, we're going into university. That's what our parents recommended. That's what our friends are doing. But I feel like there's that, the, the ones that are left out of that. Well, I'll state it this way. And yes, that it's a huge opportunity. Uh, when you think about going to school today becomes the purpose of a system rather than personal growth supported by the system. That's why I always keep going back to education. Uh, one more comment on that is I spoke in front of a statewide uh, school career counselors conference. And the majority of them believe manufacturing is that 1940s era, dark, dirty, young, say, you know, break your back, sweat all day environment. And so number one is, we have to do better educating our school systems on what today's manufacturing really is, what technologies are employed. And then there's the promotion of these opportunities for kids in high school. And so the thing that works best, I think, for us so far is, is I, as a business owner, you know, have committed myself to creating a partnership with the school counselors with the teachers, any school that has or even doesn't have, I have a, an example where the school did not even have a manufacturing program, is you get involved with them and you help them understand what we have to offer. They knew who their kids are. Mm -hmm. And in these areas where, you know, I call it somewhat suppressed uh, environments, um, those kids really trust those teachers. And so I've had the teachers to my job and I've had field trips and kids and the, the feedback I got when I had 70 kids through here one day was, wow, this is cool. Can I come to work here? <laughs> and then we had a parent night at one of my partner shops and, uh, parents were asking, but they somehow get involved in this program. And so you're right. There's a lot of situations out there that you and I don't even think about on a daily basis, but they're real. And you know, a lot of those kids are going to school and they're helping pay the rent. Yeah. And you know, what a great way to help them start off on a, a different foot, let's say, than their parents did. 
and get into something that they can really grow in and eventually make as much as that kid that goes to college without having the debt associated with it. Yeah. So I'm yeah. excited about it. Oh, well, I was going to ask you, do you think that it makes a big difference if a kid can see not just, and this is just my own curiosity, they can see, wow, these jobs are available. Okay. That's, a, that's exciting and interesting. Do you think it impacts them even more if they can see like a career trajectory path? Like if you lay that out for them and say, Hey man, you know, you can run this big ass machine and make these really cool parts and make really good money. And then you can work your way up to say James who works for you and is like freaking MacGyver and, you know, runs the show. And then you could be Brad. You could, you could own a business. Like, do you think that that's like, that's when I get excited is when they can see beyond. Yeah. So I, I kind of laid out my succession plan here and, um, it involves one of those people we're talking about that all they believed they would be was a machinist. And he approached me one day and said, I'd really like to own my own machine shop. And I said, I'll make you deal. I will advance you through this company and teach you what you need to know to go out and be on your own one day. His eyes lit up. He's oh like, my wow. God. I got chills. Yeah. So yes, you, you have to show that opportunity or those possibilities, um, to help them see there's more to it than what we're just talking about in front of us. And I think that's where school systems lack sometimes is that ability to understand what these industries are. And then the career counselors help paint that picture. Right. In general. The picture they're painting today is if you go to college, you can make $150,000 a year. Well, I have some employees on my machine shop that don't have a college education that are pushing that number and they don't have any college debt. Right. So, <laughs> you know, we need to quit misleading at the school level when we're talking to young people about their futures. I would really ask that education be more well-rounded in their view of the world. However, that comes back on what I feel my obligation is, and that's to educate them. And it works. Yes. I love it. Um, Seth Godin talks a lot about changing the education system too. So for you listening, if you're not following Seth, I highly recommend that as well, because he has a lot of good ideas about education. And I think what I've seen as well um, in working with school counselors is they're just relying on that default narrative and it's not uh, any fault of their own, but they need to know there are other opportunities. There are other options. Here's what they are. Mm -hmm. And they usually, I mean, the, all the ones that I've spoken to light up, they're yeah. so excited and, um, and very engaged and believe in, you know, manufacturing and, and what it can do. And, Gosh, unfortunately, we have to wrap up. I want to talk really quickly. So you talk about a desired future state, and I think that's important. You are very visionary. For anyone who doesn't know Brad, um, he is very much a visionary and always thinking 20 steps ahead. And when he's being quiet, he's listening. He's listening and he's thinking. And I know you want to see every student graduate from high school and be prepared for a next step. You want to create effective and efficient partnerships between education and employers. That's a beautiful uh, vision. And I think doable. That's the other thing. It's not some pie in the sky right. hype dream. And you also talk about a diverse set of education and training models that are recognized and supported. And I feel like that's where that noun verb comes in. There's action and right. it's consistently evolving, right? 
Well, yeah, but the, to that last desired future state uh, comment, really, it also means to me that, alluding to something I already said, let's quit being centric on this type of kid going to this type of education. There's more to this world than that. Open up, so open up the possibilities. There's different learning uh, environments that are effective, like our on-the-job learning opportunities or apprenticeships. Um, there's different ways of thinking about what subject matters really are relevant versus what we're teaching, and really start measuring and addressing the personal growth of every student, not just showing up to class. Education grades themselves in various ways, and I believe you can't really grade yourself. You can't say by numbers, we help every kid attain something that they step out of school and are effective in using that in gainful employment. I back that up by saying I think there needs to be more STEM education or emphasis in the school science, technology, engineering, and math. Everybody thinks about that in terms of being an engineer or being a scientist. No, there's basic stuff that can be taught, especially when you think about today's technology employed in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. It's a different skill set today than it was in 1940. We're not teaching that. So anyway, in support of my desired state of every kid graduates from high school, when you look out the dropout rate of the general population, or I should say the kids not studying those STEM uh, areas, the STEM area kids are graduating at a rate of like 97.7%. Mm -hmm. There's a reason for that, because it's a desired skill and knowledge that we all want, you know, as employers. So there's something to think about there. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about the future. Um, I believe the state of Utah so far has shown me their, their desire and ability to be innovative, kind of question the status quo. And, um, they really support folks like me and those I've worked with to get the right things done for the right reasons. Absolutely. Um, I've seen that firsthand. And uh, I think anybody listening to this or watching this, if you haven't uh, or aren't connected to Brad Robeson from Clean Machine, um, reach out and connect with him on LinkedIn. And if you ever have a question or you want to have a conversation, let's say you're a manufacturer and you want to turn workforce development into a verb, I'm sure that Brad would be happy to have a conversation with you. So I encourage you to do that. And there's a really important, I want to leave with this. There's a really important thing that you say and do. And I know this because I've had the, the great opportunity to work with you. And you talk about unleashing the human potential. And I feel like that's the fire that's behind your platform, your drive, and I think that's, to me, that's my takeaway of the crux of the difference that you are making. And if we can encourage and equip teachers and counselors and other manufacturers and MEPs, take it just that little step further. And I wondered if we could end, if you would talk a little bit about how your vision of unleashing human potential, because I believe that's why your business is so incredibly successful. Your team is so engaged. Um, so would you maybe expound on why that's important? Well, I, I fixed a lot of businesses in my career and I, I saw a lot of uh, reasons why businesses fail or don't perform well and for me, it's not so much as the equipment it is, you know, how we view human beings. And 
I saw a lot of suppressed uh, people. I witnessed a lot of um, really bad you know, behaviors from leadership or lack of leadership or managers that um, just don't sit well with me. But it was always present when there was a poor performing company. So I always thought, you know what? I want to provide an opportunity for uh, people who really want to do something, who really want to be respected, uh, who work in a within a company or that you know we we respect everybody here. We talk about it a lot. Um, we educate a lot. We provide the training, and our whole goal is to grow. And that's just not companies' bottom line. That's us as people. I think we need to do a whole episode just just on that. What do you say? Will you come back? Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Well, for you listening, I just want to take a minute and say thank you from the bottom of my heart for investing time in yourself and your business today. If no one else tells you, um, you're valued, you're doing really important work, and um, you're making a difference. So Thank you. Keep manufacturing out loud. And thank you, Brad, for spending time with me today. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Until next time, everybody. If you're not already, subscribe to the Manufacturing Masters podcast on Apple Music or Spotify. And for a deeper dive, head on over to manufacturing-masters.com. It's everything they never taught you in school.